Today is Monday and I hope you're having a great start to the week. We have an update on the Vic Mignogna litigation. Now, it's still pretty early in the morning and I'm still a little groggy, but I want to get this video out ASAP so you guys can get informed if you haven't seen this yet. So, this video is not really going to be an opinion piece. I'm just going to present the document. We're going to run through it, see what it's all about. It's fairly straightforward and brief from what I've seen. But again, I don't really want to get into my opinion on it. Just going to present it. And then I will show you information on Funimation's attorney representing them in this action. So that's the plan for this video. Let's get into it. All right, welcome back. Let's jump right into this. Victor Mignana, the plaintiff, of course, versus Funimation Productions at Limited Liability Corporation, Jamie Markey, Monica Real, and Ronald Toye, the defendants. This document is the Defendant Funimation Productions LLC's original answer, verified denial, and affirmative defenses. Now, as I already stated, they more or less make a general denial to everything, which is pretty much the expected answer. But again, I don't really want to get into my opinion. Let's just... Uh, Get started here. Comes now Defendant Funimation Productions LLC. By the way, if you do want to read this on your own time, by all means, go ahead and pause the video and just take a look at it that way. That's why I made it really bold. Now, I am blocking a little bit of it, so let me let me, let me actually, uh, let's see here. I will put myself in this corner, and you know what? Let me see if I can move the mic a little bit, too. I want to give you guys the most, like, amount to read this as possible. Let's, uh, wait a second. I don't even know. Okay. <laughs> There we go. Thank you guys for bearing with me. As you can see, uh, I'm trying to make that a little easier for you guys. Okay. So continuing on, let's, let's start from the top here. Come now, Defendant Funimation Productions, LLC. Defendant files its original answer, verified denial of affirmative defenses to plaintiff's original petition, and would respectfully show the court as follows. Number one, general denial. Defendant generally denies each and every allegation contained in plaintiff's original petition. So Funimation denies everything that, you know, Vic Mignogna and his counsel put in the original petition as author authorized by Rule 92 of the Texas Rules of Civil Procedure and demand strict proof thereof. Section 2, verified denial. 1. Defendant specifically denies plaintiff's allegations that all conditions precedent have been performed or have occurred. Number 2. Defendant specifically denies that plaintiffs complied with requirements of Defamation Mitigation Act before filing this lawsuit. Number 3. Defendant specifically denies that plaintiffs purported request to defendant complied with requirements set forth in 73055D of the Texas Civil Practices and Remedies Code. Plaintiff's request failed to describe all of the allegedly false and defamatory statements made by defendant and state the time and place of their publication if known. Uh, I was going to make an opinion piece there, but like I said, I'm going I'm to try to abstain from that. Instead, plaintiff refers to unspecified tweets from other voice actors who appeared to be speaking on behalf of Funimation. So they're referring, of course, to the section in the original petition of vicarious liability, tying, you know, these free agents, so to speak, in terms of Monica Real or Ron Toye, uh, specifically Ron Toye, though, uh, tying him to Funimation. Without identifying the substance of the tweets and the time and place of their publication, plaintiff also alleges that the implication of Funimation's tweets is that plaintiff engaged in S-harassment or S-threatening behavior when the referenced Funimation tweets do not use the word S or refer specifically to any threatening or harassing behavior by plaintiff. Let's actually stop right here. Give me a moment to pull the tweet up. Let's take a look at that. Tweet number one says, Everyone, we wanted to give you an update on the Vic Mignogna situation. Following an investigation, Funimation recast Vic Mignogna in Morose Mononokian Season 2. Funimation will not be engaging Mignogna in future productions. Part of our core mission is to celebrate the diversity of the anime community and to share our love for the genre and its positive impact on all. We do not any kind of harassment or threatening behavior by, I'm sorry, being directed at everyone. I did make a little uh, speaking error there, but they also did indeed make a typo and they correct that in the next tweet edit. We do not condone any kind of harassment or threatening behavior being directed at anyone. So let's read it one more time with that correction. Part of our core mission is to celebrate the diversity of the anime community and to share our love for the genre and its positive impact on all. We do not condone any kind of harassment or threatening behavior being directed at anyone. And that's clearly where the implication lies. So going back to this segment, plaintiff also alleges that the implication of Funimation's tweets is that plaintiff engaged in S harassment or S threatening behavior when the referenced Funimation tweets do not use the word S or refer specifically to any threatening or harassing behavior by plaintiff. 
So make of that what you will. Again, trying to abstain my opinion on this for the most part. Section three, affirmative defenses. Number one, defendant is not liable to plaintiff because plaintiff's own acts or omissions proximately caused or distributed to plaintiff's injuries. Basically, it seems like they're saying, you know, you kind of brought this upon yourself. Number two, defendant is not liable to plaintiff because defendant's allegedly defamatory statements were substantially true. Interesting. Number three, defendant is not liable to plaintiff because plaintiff and or his agents consented to and or published the allegedly defamatory statements by discussing them in public and on social media outlets. So, you know, that's citing more so there, there, there are some areas where defamation specifically talks about uh, how it needs to be like private information that's brought to the public that damages reputation in terms of a management perspective or a business perspective. But at this, I, I forget which states differ on this. So again, I'm not really going to voice my opinion on this. And I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an attorney, as you guys know. Continuing, number four, defendant is not liable to plaintiff because of plaintiff's previously diminished reputation. It's kind of saying that, you know, it was already bad. They didn't make it any worse. Number five, defendant is not liable to plaintiff on the grounds that defendant was induced. Is that say, does that say induced? It got cut off a little bit. Oh, yeah, is induced and provoked to make statements by the wrongful or malicious acts of plaintiff. Keyword malicious, as you guys know, uh, malice ties into de defamatory statements. Uh, defendant is not liable. Well, number six, defendant is not liable to plaintiff for allegedly defamatory made by third parties, including any allegedly defamatory statements made by any other defendant sued in this lawsuit. Basically, you know, not accepting the vicarious liability because those other defendants were not agents or employees of defendant and therefore were not acting within the course and scope of any agency or employment. Number seven, defendant is not liable to plaintiff because the allegedly defamatory statements were not made with actual malice. There we go. Tying that in with where, where did we just talk about that? I think it was right. Uh, oh yeah, number five. So they're tying that in there. Number eight, defendant is not liable to plaintiff because any alleged defam defamatory statements were statements of opinion. Number nine, defendant is not liable to plaintiff because plaintiff does not identify a valid contract that was the subject of any alleged interference. Oh, well, let's read that one more time. That's interesting. Number nine, defendant is not liable to plaintiff because plaintiff does not identify a valid contract that was subject of any alleged interference. Interesting. So obviously, you know, that brings to mind the tortious interference with the contract and business prospects. All right. I mean, this is a general denial to all of the uh, prayers that the plaintiff is bringing forward. You know what the plaintiff wants, so it makes sense. Number 10, defendant is not liable to plaintiff because plaintiff waived or otherwise forfeited any contractual rights he claims to have had through plaintiff's own conduct. You know, again, kind of saying it's on him, it seems. And I, I'm not, I know I said I wasn't going to bring my opinion into this. I'm really trying not to. Um, I'm trying to bring what little law knowledge I have to kind of explain some of this stuff for the people. Now, like, I, I'm sure a lot of you guys know more about this than I do, but I'm also sure there are some that, that don't, to be fair. So hopefully this is kind of insightful to, to those people. Number 11, defendant is not liable to plaintiff because plaintiff is libel proof. Plaintiff is libel proof. That's uh, rather interesting. I guess they might be going after, you know, the public figure approach with number 11 there. Number 12, if defendant is found liable for damages, defendants intends to seek a reduction of damages under the appropriation responsibility statute, including any credits for a settling person. So, of course, you know, they're going to generally deny everything. But if they do incur a loss and, you know, damages that they owe the, the plaintiff, Vic, they want to, you know, lessen that, mitigate it. And really, I think what they're going for here is not trying to get hit with punitives, of course. Punitive damages, for those of you that don't know, it's a increased monetary reward, uh, usually to kind of make an example out of the, the loss, you know, of the person who lost that, that case. But again, I'm not a lawyer, an attorney. You might want to look into that on your own time a little bit more. Uh, number 13, plaintiff is not entitled to exemplary damages in regard to any def defamation claim, which plaintiff failed to timely serve a request for correction, retraction, or clarification within 90 days after learning the publication of the alleged defamatory statement. This is interesting. So they're citing Texas Civil Practices and Remedies Code 73055. I wonder if we can find that. Give me one second. Okay, so I was able to find it. Here we go. Texas Civil Practice and Remedies Code, Civil Practice and Remedies 73.055, request for correction, clarification, or retraction. Okay. Let's see what this is all about, because I honestly don't know. I'm not familiar with that area of Texas law. There's many areas of Texas law I'm not familiar with. This is one of them. A, a person may maintain an action for defamation only if, one, the person has made a timely and sufficient request for a correction, clarification, or retraction from the defendant, or 
the defendant has made a correction, clarification, or retraction. B, a request for a correction, clarification, or retraction is timely if made during the period of limitation for commencement of an action for defamation. C, if not later than the 90th day, so three months about, after receiving knowledge of the publication, the person does not request a correction, clarification, or retraction. The person may not recover exemplary damages. D, a request for a correction, clarification, or retraction is sufficient if it, one, is served on the publisher, two, is made in writing, reasonably identifies the person making the request, and is signed by the individual claiming to have been defamed or by the person authorized attorney or agent, the person's authorized attorney or agent. Three, states with particularly the statement alleged to be false and defamatory and to the extent known, the time and place of publication. Four, alleges the defamatory meaning of the statement. And five, specifies the circumstances causing a defamatory meaning of the statement if it arises from something other than the express language of the publication. And finally, E, a period of limitation for commencement of an action under the section is told during the period allowed by sections 73.056 and 73.057. So that's actually really interesting stuff, guys. I don't know. I have said multiple times in this video, and I'll say it again, really trying not to give too much of my own opinion on this stuff, kind of just presenting the information here for you guys. So I don't know. I find that interesting, and uh, I could say more about that, but I'm not going to... Uh, let's just continue on. Form your own opinion on that part and, of course, all of this stuff. And let me know in the comments below what you think about all of this. But we're almost done here. Let's uh, continue on and wrap this up, okay? So I think we left off at 13. Yep. So now number 14. If defendant is found liable for exemplary damages, those damages must be capped under the Texas Damages Act and Due Process Clause of the United States Constitution and the Due Course of Law provisions of the Texas Constitution. Finally, we have... Uh, section four jury demand defendant demands a jury trial and tenders the appropriate fee with this answer and five request for disclosure under texas civil procedure uh, 194 defendant requests that plaintiff disclose within 30 days of the service of the request the information material described in rule 194.2 now let's take a look at the attorney representing funimation uh, again no opinion on if they're good or bad i have no idea i'm just going to give you a little info from their own page before we get into this part the very clear takeaway from the Funimation segment. Doesn't seem like they are trying to settle, but do they have merit with some of their defenses? That's up for you to form your opinion on, by all means. And if you would be so inclined, let us know in the comments below. I'm sure a lot of us, myself included, would kind of love to see the general consensus on their answer and if you think there's merit there or not. So be sure to leave your thoughts in the comments below. Now let's take a look at Evan Stone, the attorney representing that action here for Funimation and uh, some of the information on Evan Stone. So, Evan Stone's introduction to copyright law began with a high school job working for an upscale portrait photographer in San Antonio, Texas. Stone registered his first copyright as a teenager and went on to study filmmaking, database programming, and 3D modeling slash animation at the University of North Texas and California State University, Los Angeles. Stone continued his focus on intellectual property law as president of the Intellectual Property Law Association at Texas A&M School of Law. During this period, Stone joined the legal team at Funimation Entertainment the largest producer and distributor of anime in the United States. There, Stone created and still oversees an all-encompassing intellectual property rights enforcement program operated by three dedicated infringement specialists using proprietary software Stone created. Stone now opened his firm in 2010 and was admitted to the United States District Court of the, I'm sorry, for the Northern District of Texas. There he began the now infamous practice of suing entire groups of internet pirates in a series of BitTorrent infringement lawsuits. Stone still engages in such litigation when necessary, but has since branched out into more traditional cases of copyright infringement, including those involving unauthorized online streaming of motion pictures, unauthorized display of photography and graphic design, unauthorized public performance of music, distribution of counterfeit merchandise, unauthorized distribution of photography, and patent infringement defense. In the course of his career, Stone has worked on DVD counterfeiting cases with the criminal division of the IRS and the Department of Homeland Security. Oh, now it all makes sense why they went with this because, you know, Monica, Homeland Security. Okay, I'm just kidding. Anyways, uh, okay. Additionally, Stone has coordinated enforcement efforts and investigations within the FBI and Department of Justice's Computer Hacking and Intellectual Property Crime Division. There's some information on his background there. Make of it what you will. Presentations. You know what? I really don't want to read all this stuff with the presentations. If you guys want to read that, by all means, pause the video 
and and take a look but i i don't think we need to get into all of that stuff so let's start wrapping this up i hope you found this video at least a little bit interesting and informative if you did please give it a thumbs up that certainly does help and subscribe if you're not if you are subscribed be sure you have the notification bell also turned on so your subscription can most likely work there's still problems here and there so that's why it's a good idea to join the discord server where updates actually do work and of course there's other benefits to join the server as well and maybe give me a follow on twitter links to all of that in the description there and if you'd like to do a bit extra to support the channel consider becoming a sponsor on patreon or sending a one-time donation through streamlabs or paypal these are all good options in these trying times here on youtube if you're aware of all the shenanigans that's going on but let's not get into all of that i have some shout outs for the wonderful people who helped promote my last video titled unbelievable cute ruby parody video triggers half the fandom so this is basically ruby shouts out to nightmare 13 Deserac, stormy nameless person random fandom pot on the brain to be his best girl mr anime 343 blade charge lacus 1236547 mashed up potatoes monet paragon langston of amped guard thank you all very much i truly appreciate it hope you enjoyed this one again as i said and i will see you next time yeah.